Welcome to our sixth collectability podcast. Today, it is my great pleasure to speak with René Bayer, whose family owns Bioeconometry in Zurich. His family dates back to 1485, but they only ventured into the business of selling timekeepers by 1760. Bayer is the oldest active watch and jewelry retailer in the world and, historically, also one of the most important. From its private museum to its exceptional atelier and after sales service, Bayer is one of those rare places where you can see and feel the true culture of horology. René Bayer is the eighth generation of his family business, which draws a parallel line with the history of the Swiss watch industry itself. To call him just a retailer, or even just a watch and clock collector, would be a huge understatement of who he is and what he does. Herr Bayer, thank you so much for accepting this invitation to talk to us here at Collectability. I'm going to start right away with the first question. The history of the Bayer family goes back to 1760. I think you write a longer history than some countries. Can you take us to this unique 260-year-long saga? Of course. So I'm representing the eighth generation today. I have not even known my grandfather. They passed away. My grandma also before I got to this world. But we are having a very good archives. We want to make a story about the specific or about the general view on buyer. When did it start? Uh, we know it was 1760. I understand you came from Germany, uh, your family, of course, your forefathers, came from Germany to Switzerland in 1760. Yes, you're perfectly right. Actually, by a list that uh, I cannot give you the name of the home site, but we are the company 1067, which is known to exist. So there are the very first were Japanese soya produced and other things. And we are the oldest watch retail store. But of course, we did not start this retail store right away. We were first adjusting the clocks in the town, like Feuertal and coming over the Rhine River from Donauwesching, as you were saying before. We know the family history goes back to 1485. So 1670, we made that decisive path to go over the Rhine River, just mm -hmm. really on the other edge of the Rhine River, where we stayed another almost 100 years before we came to Zurich. That was 1860. Yes, we were selling spices and other things, side watches, because at that time, mainly were only big clocks existing, which were mounted on walls, which were weight driven. And people could bring them to the marketplace, like such as you go for fruit and vegetables. They could bring the clocks there. So the first recordings in books, we had to enlist to be able to go in these markets in Winterthur and in Zurich. That's how we started the business before it was just more or less like a small workshop because at the time the size of a window would have had the size of a bottom of a bottle of <laughs> wine it's not possible to make bigger uh, flat glasses that's why also the old windows you see in old towns they are always made of many many small pieces of glass and were put together as a picture it's called the tiffany technique today very interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. I know also that you came to the Bahnhofstraße, not exactly the present location, around 1877. And this was your great-grandmother, Caroline Bayer. Actually, it was in 1864 they started to fill out a small river where people were putting the dirt from the buildings to dispose it. It was put in the river and it went down to the main station where it was going to the Limat. And of course, the city wants to have loot and they said, this is the only space, Bahnhofstrasse, where we could make a channel road. And that's why they decided to fill that small river which was used only for dumping reasons. It was also smelling, and you could hear the noise of frogs, which are there. So in 1874, as you said, we were the third coming company to the Bahnhofstraß. Before it was only Sprüngli, the famous chocolate maker, Credit Swiss Bank. Swiss was also building the famous Gotthard Tunnel, the railway tunnel, of course. And that was a very major breakthrough for the Swiss economy because Switzerland was very poor at that time. 
you settle then in the Bahnhofstrasse number 31, your no, present location. No, More that right? was a little bit later. We started in Bahnhofstrasse 23, then we went into Bahnhofstrasse 25, which were both in the building you cannot see now aside us, mm -hmm. just across the street. And in 1925, they brought down a villa here and built this banking building. Yeah. And we moved in as a first person in 1926. And if you calculate in a few years from now, we will celebrate 100 years that we're in that building. But we were always under contract with Credit Suisse from being a renter from them. Mm -hmm. They're more than is 140 years old now. Unbelievable. And we were just in three different positions. And we hope that we'll stay until 2034. We will remain definitely in this location because that's the end of time when we renew the contract. Which is incredible. See, it's only one of the incredible stories related to Bayat. I think your father was invited to evaluate and make the first inventory of the magnificent watch and clock collection in the Topkapi Museum in Istanbul, a work that lasted several weeks. But that's an incredible collection. It must have been an honor to be able to see and touch and evaluate all those pieces. Yeah, you're right. That was probably the beginning yeah. of the 60s. They were treated as guests of uh, honor, like uh, highly politicians. They were always having a limousine at that disposition, a beautiful hotel. But of course, they were very afraid. They've always had people with machine guns in the back of my father. <laughs> my mother, she could enjoy it, see all the beautinesses of Istanbul, which was Constantinople before. But my father had to work really hard in that museum. And I was able to go two or three times to that place. And unfortunately, the Turkish government cannot always take care of all the things they have because a lack of money and the collection was for many years diseased. It was yeah. very poor quality. They were able afterwards to have some specialists that were cleaning a little bit the pieces. But Turkey is still today afraid to give any of these pieces outside of Turkey. So Mr. Hayek at the time offered to restore the whole collection, but they were so afraid. So at the end, it was just a small exhibition that Mr. Hayek was contributing by pieces from Brücke, which he gave to them because they have a very beautiful Brücke Pont du Sympathique, which is like a Fabergé act. So we are proud that we have been named for that. But, you know, there are other very beautiful collections, such as the one that was done by Mr. Atwood in America, near yes. Chicago, which unfortunately was torn down and is now again open at least for a good part in a museum in north of Chicago, but closer in the city than before where it was in Rockford, Illinois. Exactly where the Packard pieces are. That's it. But they used to be the main attraction of that museum, but it's the only museum that could even today rival with Patek Philippe if it would still be there, but it has been broken off by yep. in six or seven auctions. So it's unbelievable yep. collection. And it was also Swiss, which was a friend collector of my father who was collecting most of the pieces for Mr. Atwood. And uh, he was even building a hotel complex above the museum so we could always enjoy hotel and good food. Uh, and you were talking about Nicholas G. Hayek, that mm -hmm. great man of enterprise in Switzerland. And there's a very interesting story. We know Nicholas G. Hayek took over Breguet uh, at a certain time and now owned by the Swatch Group. But in the 1980s, Breguet was offered to buyer. It was, but... <laughs> exactly. I, I, I think not, at the time it was show me. <laughs> this was a time where it was owned a little bit by... Many company, Esprit was in there, Boucheron was in there, and it was a Mr. François Baudet. And he always tried because he saw that there was not enough money coming into that company to really make it big, as Mr. Hayek made it at the end. So he was always trying to find somebody who is interested in going for that wonderful name. It's a little bit like the story with Jean-Claude Beaver and Plampa, which he bought for, I think, as little as 18000 Swiss francs mm -hmm. and sold it back to Mr. Hayek 10 years later for 70 million Swiss francs. So kind of a nice investment they made. Huh? Absolutely. But, <laughs> and a good profit. But Mr. Beaver was afterwards also still very successful with other things like Omega and Hublot. And who knows, he's even now retired 
after being working for LVMH. And uh, now he starts probably another thing because he's never going to rest like that. And then, Herr Bayer, we come to the present time and to your watch. You started in the company in 1983, I believe. Uh, yes, officially, I was still on in my practice years. I was first in the watchmaker school in uh, La Chaux-de-Fonds, uh, as I have been before in the in Neuchâtel for the commercial high school. But I went off to Germany to colleagues like Huber or Wempe, which you might know also well. And uh, from there, I went two years to the United States. Unfortunately, my father had a heart attack and I had to cut short on that. But that was basically in 1986. I really came into company. And since then, I could never escape anymore. <laughs> It's like They are catching me, yes. <laughs> It's a curse in a good and a bad way. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And I, I, I read in your excellent magazine, Beyond, you issue twice a year, I believe, uh, yes. that your first day in the shop was quite remarkable. In the morning, you sold a swatch piece. And then in the afternoon, you took your uncle to buy a reference 3450 by Patek mm -hmm. Philippe. <laughs> That was a great start, a great omen to, to the time. It was quite a big become. start, yes. <laughs> yeah, I got really started well. I did a morning uh, swatch to warm up. And in the afternoon, I did sell 3450, which, by the way, I own now again because when my uncle died in 2002, my aunt was deciding that the watch goes back. But already then, it made a nice profit for her when she sold it to me. And you know how, in the meantime, this piece is flying and continues to fly, and it exceeds all the price estimates that I ever would have thought. And, and I think flippers... Uh, how we yeah. know them nowadays. We'll love to hear this. You sold it to your uncle for 14,600 Swiss francs. That's the official price uh, then. Bought it back for 70,000. Yes, so, and today I could sell it probably easy for exactly. 200,000 or more. But that, it's not a question to sell it. So please <laughs> flip us, don't call me for that. Okay, yeah, exactly. <laughs> One of the very interesting things I think you have developed in the buyer company is the Uhren Atelier. So the atelier for maintenance and repair of the, the, the watches, which is a part that many retailers lack. I think it's the biggest and most competent in Switzerland nowadays and where you perform maintenance, but also restoration of vintage and antique clocks. And that's incredible because it's a mix of metiers that are not easy to find. You are absolutely right. And it is only for now about 15 years. We have everything under one roof. Before the atelier was always separate from the company, about 10 minutes away from here. But it is much more comfortable to now really say we are at the same time a retail business, but also production center. And we can show it like the museum. While you go two floors down, you're in the museum. While you go two floors up, you're in the watchmaking repair center. And of course, we also official repair center for Rolex, for Paddock, and so on. We know this might be changing over the course of the next few years, not for Rolex, but other companies. I don't mention names. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I just say, it's of course very interesting that we can also restore the piece for our museum, but we have also other museums which have no restoration center that even from the United States sent their pieces here. We fix them and send them back. So it is a known place. And today I would say there are in Switzerland three places where you can repair watches such as we do. It's at the museum in La Chaux de Fonds, mm -hmm. Parmigiani and Bayer. And of course, Bukhara has a bigger workshop in Lucerne. But when it comes to really high-end restoration projects or even pieces which we are making basically from scratch to zero again, that have gone through the fire or have had any terrible accidents, most of the time people refer to one of these three addresses. Incredible. And you mention it, the museum, which is one of the, the very important parts of the existence of Bayer nowadays, I would say. We have to say Bayer is not only about selling watches, it's also about preserving the history and culture of watchmaking. The Bayer Museum is an incredible space located in the Bayer building and is one of the highlights to many visitors who come to Zurich. It houses, I believe, almost 2,000 pieces, Herr Bayer? 
Uh, it houses, but they are not on display. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I could equip probably about six museums with the watches we have. Right. Unfortunately, we are not as lucky as Patrick Philippe in Geneva that has a whole building dedicated to that purpose. Actually, it's considered one of the top five museums in the world. I'm not aiming for that, but I'm very glad my father was collecting about 85% of all the pieces we have there. And I added on the rest, like 15%. And we continue to buy things. Of course, today we have to focus on what is currently made, mm -hmm. but also we like to fill in few gaps, which we still have also in the old vintage collection. But for me, museums are cultural richness that should be almost necessary while you have such an ADN like we have. You have to have credibility and you can only show the credibility by also giving back something to the industry. As I was lucky to go from Swatch to Patrick Philip in one day, I'm also glad that I can get to the public and we have visitors from all over the world. If traveling is easier, right now we are a little bit reduced, but the Swiss are finally also seeing that part of this very important cultural and technical industry which we house in Switzerland, the watch industry, and we are very proud of it. That's true. One of the questions that came to my mind, because your father, uh, Theodor Bayer, uh, started to collect more or less around the 1950s. Mm -hmm. um, And then in 1971, he opened the museum. That's what the first year, I think, of the, the museum. Yes. And uh, I was comparing this to the, well, he was friends with Philip Stern. And Philip Stern also was collecting old and rare pieces and came to open the Patek Philippe Museum, but much later in 2001. So Absolutely. could we say that Philip Stern was somehow influenced by your father's decision to openly share his collection with the public? Decided I, later to follow the same path by opening the Patek Philippe Museum? You know, I don't like to say he has learned something for us. He's clever enough to do it himself. But it was at the time Alan Bambury who was mm -hmm. mainly making the purchases for the Patek Museum when my father was in his glory years when he bought many pieces and many times in order to avoid the showdown so the price will not go up like rockets. <laughs> yes. uh, they discussed before the auction, which pieces we should take and which pieces Stern family wanted to have. So we always try to not compete to one each other, even so it would have been liked by the auction years, but the business sense of our two companies was more important. We have bought things which today even uh, Philip Stern and Thierry would love to have in their collection. I told them if we would sell it for any reason one day, I hope this is not going to be the case then it would be them that we offer them first and not through a public auction. We have sold once a few pieces, which my father has decided of the estate that were like double pieces. So he was always having the idea, you must have sometimes a second piece of the same in order to trade it in with some collectors that don't want to get money because they're rich enough. They say, give me something from your collection. I give you something from my collection. This part uh, of the company was sold and it brought, I think at the time, more than 8 million francs. It was only like, uh, I don't know, 80 pieces or so. It yeah. is not important to us. It was the wish of my father. We would also have kept them, but it's fine. He said we should invest the money that we get from that into new pieces to complete the museum and to make new acquisitions we want to perpetuate the museum, even so we officially stopped to show pieces by 1970. Afterwards, it's still too young, but we collect, we have more than 200 Swatch watches, and one day there will also be certainly an entry for them in the museum to be also on public eye. We make about three to four exhibitions yearly where we show watches which we cannot show permanently. And even the Apple Watch may have a place in the museum. Of course, you know, nothing is excluded. doesn't matter who makes it. If it's Portuguese, uh, <laughs> if it's American, Not many, if it's yeah. Japanese also. We have many Seiko, Jean LaSalle, Grand Seiko watches. You know, this is all important uh, industry. Of course, now we are the chased ones, which are number one. But for many, many years, 
it was the Germans, the Americans who made the best watches in the world. And the Swiss were basically making very inexpensive watches, but we were the Japanese of today. And uh, today our role is a different one. We are producing like champagne and <laughs> only the best of the best. <laughs> But we never forgot that uh, we have still to be thankful that we were going from the bottom to the top. That's why Mr. Hayek, our father, always say, you cannot own only companies that have the best watch companies. You must also have the bottom. You should try to focus this on a complete market. But in reality, the destiny of the watch industry in Switzerland is, of course, the high-end brands. That's the bread and butter in Switzerland. We produce about 21 million movements a year, but we make like 80% of the total volume financially with that. And, and the Chinese, they make more than 600 million watches a year, and they still only produce like a few percent of the whole market. The gene of the collector runs deep in the Bayer family. Your mother, Annette Bayer. <laughs> <laughs> we have Your... all collections. Man. That's a drama at the same time. We're all collecting things. Exactly. I'm collecting bra strings and she collected dolls and automatons. I just was in Milano where there was a robotic exhibition. Very interesting. We had pieces from the watch museum and all that is metal. My father said, it's mine. All that has beautiful clothes with uh, silk or other mm -hmm. things, it was my mother. So they had a very clear separation of what they were collecting. But at the end, today, the two collections are reunited sometimes in, in the foreign countries like uh, Germany or Italy because they are all both part of the history of the evolution. We also have from Jacques Gaudreau writing automatons that are making designs, they're writing, or they play piano. So my mother has about 40, 45 pieces, which, by the way, she passed on to me. And I'm already having also dolls and automaton museum just about 10 years, 10 minutes from here, mm -hmm. which we can show to people that are interested. So whenever there's somebody who wants to see it, just let us know in advance by email and we take care of you at least yep. once or twice a month. We open that because it's very fragile, even more fragile than watches because the clothes are more or less deteriorating every time you put light or you have humidity from human beings. Incredible. Yeah. But, and I come again to this, your mother is really a remarkable woman. I understand that regarding the Breguet Sympathie clock that is today in the Bayer Museum, during the auction where it was acquired, your father had given up bidding. But then she kept on going. And that was something that made your father very happy. And now today the piece is in the Bayer Museum. This is true. I don't know where you got that information from. <laughs> Normally, I don't speak about it, but it is true. My mother could see she's still alive. Unfortunately, my father passed away 20 years ago. She was really encouraging to get that piece. And for us, it was a one-time opportunity in life to acquire such piece because it was at that time in Poland and it was not complete. That means The pocket watch, which sits on top of that Pont de saint which was always a marriage between mother and daughter, yes. was missing. And my father had such a piece. And he always hoped that one day, perhaps the right, it's like when you have a pen and you look for the cover for that pen, all suddenly it appeared. And I think it was roughly the 25 pieces that he was trying to make. And today only seven pieces exist in the whole world. Mm -hmm. The others have been lost or have never been produced by Brugge because he was also dying. I think it was 1822 and some pieces stayed unfinished. Others were never made. Incredible. It's a nice story. It's My father has told me for almost every piece in the museum, <laughs> a very personal story. And you know, at that time, you were able to buy watches that have today a value 10 times of what they were. because. There was a time where after World War II, where people just want to get rid of everything. Pocket watches were not fashionable or usable. All wanted wristwatches. So you could even offer many people a new watch for an old one. And today, of course, the old one are more valuable than the new one. So every yeah. piece has a story. That's also the fascinating thing, which museum visitors normally don't get. 
because they cannot tell the stories around how we got these pieces. And also the Bondi Sapotic was quite a difficult thing to get out of Poland because Poland was still at that time behind the Iron Curtain and uh, it was with only diplomatic help we could get these pieces out of Poland and get it into the West. I could also tell you stories about these <laughs> things. And not even one watch has no story. All the watches have a story. And whenever I know it, I'm, of course, happy to share them with anybody. It's the adventure of collecting. It's a hunting. Yes, it's yeah. hunting. And it's like the reward. It's like the, the jelly on the bread with butter. When I get the watch with original box and with papers, then I don't have to ask too many questions. But I still ask them because I feel it's very interesting to know who was the person that owned the watch. And it makes it also more valuable if you know these details. Absolutely. And then buyer is also about uh, the very special relationship it has with some brands, with some makers. We know that in 1932, buyer starts to sell Rolex. Yes. And uh, by the way, also Gégère Le Coutre. And I think you are still the retailer who sells more Atmos worldwide, Atmos clocks. I did not update myself, but we <laughs> love to sell Atmos clocks because it's the close to get to Perpetuum Mobile. The consumption of energy is so ridiculous that over 10 years, it would take the energy to put the light bulb on. Thank God, the Ecolucle is still producing them. And uh, it's the only company that makes them. It's a patent that Mr. Reuters was developing then. They modified it later on because the beginning it was with... Um, I don't know how you say in English. It's with a material that is not good. The mercury, sorry. Then in 1934, they changed it to the difference of air mm -hmm. variation that was able by a gas. The watches itself are beautiful. They're timeless. And they're also a great gift for people that have worked for a certain time mm -hmm. with a company to give a commemoration gift. As a milestone. As a milestone. That's it. Yeah. And then even before Rolex and Jaeger, 1893, you start working with IWC only 25 years after its founding. Mm -hmm. The brand was quite new. It was a newcomer. But the most important brand is Patek Philippe. It was founded in 1839. And that was exactly the same year you started with the brand. So along with Tiffany of New York, Bayer shares the title of longest standing customer of Patek Philippe, a relationship that goes back almost 180 years. This is incredible. It is incredible. Let's just, for the history, start with Satya C, which we were really one of the very, very first clients because Florentine A. Jones, the founder of IWC, was an American, you know, and uh, he made the watches only for America. He all exported for the first 20 years the watches were all going to U.S. And uh, we were really the first Swiss retailer. And while we were making now a store transformation, we gave them also the evidence and we have an official plate that we are also for IWC, the oldest retailer in the world. So we are very proud of that. And don't forget, Portugal has also a very close history with IWC because of the famous Portuguese Portuguese. model was the first one. They made in that size for Portuguese, which normally is surprising because Portuguese people like more the Latin taste like Patek, where the watches are smaller. But exceptionally, this watch was very big and it got its name from the Portuguese. And so sometimes you don't really plan things, but they just happen as they do. Now with Patek Philip, I have to be honest, Patek was founded by also Polish people. Mm -hmm. uh, Top Zapek, uh, which is now today also again a new watch brand, which is was reborn. But we did not start in 1839. That would be a lie. Also, Tiffany did not start in 1839. They started in 1842 because at that time, Paddock was not having airplanes to transport the watches to America. So it was the first travel itinerary that Philip, I think, was making to the US and he sold the watches on its way to make the money to get on with his journey. The journey took about three times longer than we we're predicting. And he had to sell all the watches to people that he was meeting 
on his journey because otherwise he would not have had the money to come back. <laughs> Today, nobody will believe that story, but Kradik has officially been releasing it. And they were happy that they come back with their life because at that time, it was even much more dangerous to cross over the Atlantic than with the Titanic in 1912. Mm -hmm. They already went over there in 1842. It was a very, very courageous act to go to the United States. But probably they had got some information from Florentine A. Jones how he did it because most of his watches were also arriving in the States. But for Panic, this was unbelievable. And that's why also the relationship with Tiffany is so valuable to them as the one with Bayer because we have really been long around, also long around before the Stern family became official owner. And you mentioned it before, 1932, which was a very special year. It was financially between two super crises, uh, mm -hmm. 1929 and then afterwards again, World War II. It is interesting that we started our relationship with Rolex that time in 1932, which was founded in 1908, Rolex. And uh, we were, I think, the second or third retailer in Switzerland because they mainly also were selling their watches to England, where they have been very popular thanks to Mrs. Mercedes, which was swimming over the channel. Yes. And uh, that is why Rolex has had a more important relationship in the first 20 years of their existence with England than they had with Switzerland. But uh, in Switzerland, I think it was Bucher 1926, who was the first official retailer who started with Rolex and we followed six years later. And then at the same time, the Stern family, which was a producer of dials at mm -hmm. the time, were trying to take over Paddock, which they did successfully. But it was not an easy time. So Paddock was at that time between 1905 and 1935 in difficult times. It was only thanks to people like Graves and the Packard who really were making the brand again what it used to be in the century before. This relation with Patek Philippe and Bayer is something very special on several levels. You share an apprenticeship. It became a tradition for what I, I know. It started by Adrich Bayer in 1890. Yeah. He does an internship at Patek Philippe beginning actually a, a tradition for both houses because afterwards the present president of Patek Philippe Thierry Stern also started an apprenticeship but in Bayer. Yeah. We it was specially also with Philip Stern that my father had a very, very close relationship. Uh we started to really trade. We were always a few years apart. Uh, Thierry was a little bit younger than I am now and Philip asked my father how he would do things. He also went to La Chaux-de-Fonds to learn watchmaking. He was not so interested in it as I was, mm -hmm. but uh, he did a yearly course. And of course, he's industrial production manager. And I really wanted to learn the business from scratch to the end. And I think the thing with us is that I know now four generations of Stern. I know Henri Stern. Philip Stern, Jerry Stern, and now already the kids, are, which are now also starting into the company. So it is great in one lifetime, which I have spending. I have known all these famous people. Also with Rolex, I did not know Hans Wilsdorf, but I knew Mr. Heinecke for many years. Till now, they only have had four presidents in that company. And yep. I knew every one of them. And with the Sterns and the let's say the owners of Rolex, it has always been very quarterly that we never were having to make this relationship artificial. We have the same ADN. And I don't know, whenever I think something, Jerry thinks it also. And now I feel he's like my older brother. Before I gave him advice, <laughs> now he gives me advice or tells me what we should do. Uh, so we are very, very, very happy that we don't have to explain one each other what is the reason why we do business. Of course, like to make us some money. We also have to spend salaries. Patek has more than 2,000 employees. We do have now more than 60. So it is clear we make our business a business. But first thing is I do it as my hobby and I do it as my pleasure. 
and uh, that's also what differs the people that work for us. They really must like what they do. Otherwise, they're in the wrong spot to work for Bayer. Absolutely. But this relationship with Patek Philippe also produced, and I think the collectors will like this, some interesting pieces. We have 1985, the 225th anniversary yeah. of, of Bayer. I think it was a reference 3940. Exactly. With the extra small rotor, 21 carats. But this is, uh, as you say, whenever there were milestones, Patek was always celebrating them with us. And we are very happy. Also, since that time, we have made another anniversary watch. That was the first chronograph. They made all from scratch themselves. Reference, I think, 5170. Yeah, Jay. Jay, <laughs> right, for yellow gold. <laughs> for yellow. <laughs> we would also have taken in red gold, but but it always makes first red, yellow, then red, then white, and then platinum. 50 pieces, also, I believe. Yes, there were 50 pieces made. We could have sold easily double of it, but we also like that things are being rare and they are getting satisfaction to the owners that buy it. And we have very, very few customers which were able to buy the first and the second one in their lifetime. We waited after 25 years, again, an anniversary watch. But Patek and us, we like to do sometimes something in between. If we just feel there is too good to not make it, we will make it. You see, for us, it is not about anniversaries. It's about friendship. And when they can help us, they will help us as we try to help them whenever we can in other reasons and in other purposes. And that is a very special relationship. Actually, one that was rewarded by Patek Philippe during the 225th anniversary mm -hmm. with that remarkable pocket watch, the Gotthard Diligence. Um, <laughs> yes. It's, it's, it's incredible. I discovered it through your magazine. Um, the piece is striking. It's almost a westernish scene of a male stage wagon. And it's a miniature painting, a reproduction of Rudolf Koch, uh, a, a picture from 1873. This piece, I think, is very meaningful for you since it represents a part of your past history. It is part of our history, but also of the Swiss history. This exactly. painting is very famous. It's probably the most famous painting we have in Switzerland, which is now in the Kunsthaus in Zurich, the original one. And Panic was so nice to make it for us as reproduction on enamel. And he chose that carriage with a dog that is racing. Mm -hmm. And you see behind the tremola of the Gotthard, which was very important for us historically. And is still important because all the high-speed trains, all the cars, they go through that mountain. And we feel very, very honored. We have also other pieces, the Rolex Explorer. He was wearing the first time in 1953 on the Mount Everest. So we, we have also other pieces which have been at the bottom of the ocean at 10,914 meters. You know, this is all part of the museum to also share. The watch we have from Breitling that was going around the world by a balloon is also home of our museum. We do show things, not just because they're technically interesting, but sometimes they were also given to expeditions which were very successful. One uh, crucial question. I would, yeah. uh, <laughs> You have many crucial questions here. <laughs> yeah, I do. Uh, we are almost at the end. Uh, no, by no, no problem. That's I have to I like take this that. opportunity because yes. you, you are a hard man to get. <laughs> and you have a big name behind yours, either in the watch and jewelry business. So I know you and I'm very happy that you all like you are. So go ahead with one of the last questions, as you say. Many brands want to bypass retailers altogether these days. Mm -hmm. uh, but curiously, this is not a strategy of two of the most important makers in history, particularly mm -hmm. in Rolex. Do you think other makers who decide to bypass retailers uh, through the way of monobrand boutiques or whatever will regret their decision in the future? Oh, how should that? That is now probably the most difficult question you ask. When I started, we only had retail businesses as ours, which were channelists, which had several watch brands. Today, I have more than 30 
monobrand stores, so means stores at Bahnhofstraße, which are not having more than the specific brands that sponsors them. Now, it's the customer's decision what they want. If somebody has decided, let's say, for a Royal Oak for Audemars Piguet, and he only wants the Royal Oak, he does not have to come to buyer because then it's like if he would go directly to the Mapige Le Brasseau to get the watch. I am the one, the broker of the customer. I am suggesting him, let's say, have a look at the Nautilus from Panic. I love Audemars Piguet, but I think that each customer deserves to have a comparison possibility. And unfortunately, I cannot show the Audemars Piguet. Thank God they are just opposite of ours. <laughs> we can direct the people here. And sometimes I even let take the people the brand of my watch company, uh, let's say Pedic, to them so they can compare it next to the Odoma Piga. But I'm sure that they would also do the other way around. For that reason, I think there is space for multi-brand retailers as well as the factory-owned stores. I think in the future, it will be even, again, more interesting to go to businesses like Tiffany or Bayer, which have more than one brand, but they are very competent. And that is the problem. Many of the retailers were just making things perhaps too easy. They were not educating the salespeople and their technicians. For me, it's like return on investment. You have to give first before you can get something. For me, many people were just greedy, getting easy cash and not investing in really what they do. The number of multi-brand retailers have reduced dramatically. And whenever I see that they built really huge shops around us, I realize that also their profits are dropping a lot. So many times I prefer to be small and beautiful and <laughs> not big and not profitable. <laughs> Absolutely. To wrap this up, Herr Bayer, there is yep. something incredible going on at the roof of the Bayer building in Zurich. How are the Bayer bees? <laughs> Well, thank you, Ask Again, we go back in the history. Before we really started to be an official store, we were farmers. In Switzerland, we were very poor, one of the poorest countries in Europe because we had no possibility like the Portuguese to go to venture in other countries to get the materials, which we don't have. So we were very poor, and I'm very glad that farmers also today They keep many times bees in the state of Zurich, which I live here. We have alone 800 beekeepers. That's more or less one beekeeper for each community. Now we have found out in Switzerland that bees have sometimes the best conditions, not in the countryside, but in the cities, because food okay. is always available. Even when the farmer has cut down corn, The bees are afterwards having famine in these places, while in the city there are public uh, gardens, there are private people, there are flower shops, we have botanical gardens in the city. So the bees have water, they can go around. And we have normally, if it's not a bad year like this year, we have an income, let's say, of about 220 kilogram of bio-certified honey in a good year. This year, unfortunately for the honey, it's not a good one, but I'm still happy if you come once to Zurich to give you a glass of honey, which we have made from previous years, like with a good wine, in order to keep it on a high standard. You mix honey from different years together. So in a bad year like we have now, I will have enough honey. and hope that 2022 will be again a very, very good year. You're funny. Otherwise, <laughs> I don't know what I have to do. I cannot. That yes. would be a pleasure. I beaver, cheese, you. beaver cheese and buyer honey. <laughs> this is true. By the way, I want in the beginning to do the same thing like Jean-Claude, having cows and bring them down to the city. But the city of Zurich told me it's not a good idea on the concrete. So it is unfortunately something we have to adopt. And bees are perfect because... They feel better in the city now. They produce more honey in the city than when they produce out in the countryside where they use a lot of pesticides if they get it from plants that were treated or not treated. So the honey that is collected in the city is 95% percent 
not treated uh, with chemicals, the trees yeah. or the plants. Yeah, Baya, it was a real honor and a real pleasure to talk to you. Your love and fascination for horology is palpable, and I think no one who is listening to us today will be able to avoid a pilgrimage to the Bahnhofstrasse <laughs> when in Zurich, where the biochronometry and the museum are located. Thank you so, so much for your time, Herbaya. Well, I thank you. And again, Portugal is in my heart. <laughs> thank you so much, Herbaya. Thank you all for listening. And you have enjoyed this podcast. Please like and subscribe. And also remember, following us on any podcast player you enjoy using in order not to miss our future recordings. Thank you very much for listening. This is Carlos Torres for Collectability.